Okay, I guess uh, we can get started. Um, hi all, uh, thanks for joining us from all over the world. We have uh, quite a few people in attendance today. Uh, my name is Savin and today with my colleagues, uh, Jason and Brian, we're going to talk about a project that we very recently open sourced uh, called Metaflow. And uh, in today's workshop, we will walk you through uh, in terms of how Metaflow might be useful for your data science projects. And we hope that this entire session is super fun. Uh, we would definitely like to thank you, um, our collaborators. So this workshop earlier was supposed to be part of the user 2020 conference at St. Louis, uh, but unfortunately, because of the pandemic, uh, we had to move everything uh, to a virtual venue. And uh, we were supported very ably by the user communities in Africa. Uh, so much thanks to them. Before we begin, uh, because uh, there are going to be certain hands-on component to this workshop, it would be rather nice uh, if you can install uh, the R package Metaflow on your laptop. Uh, the instructions can be obtained by going to this URL, uh, bit.ly slash Metaflow R. And uh, if for any reason you are unable to install Metaflow, uh, that's again totally fine. Uh, you can just uh, see uh, what the instructors are doing and just follow along. And throughout this workshop, we have a number of uh, teaching assistants who are going to handle your questions. So you can either post your questions on Zoom Q&A, and it would be nice if you can make your questions visible to all the attendees. And um, you would have also received uh, an email uh, confirmation about the workshop that has a link to GitHub. So if that's something that you prefer, uh, please post your questions over there as well. We are monitoring both the channels. And uh, we also have live captions. So uh, on your screen uh, within Zoom webinar, uh, you would see a tag called closed captioning. So you can enable that. And uh, that will essentially allow you to uh, follow along the workshop. Uh, there's a separate uh, URL as well for captioning, if that's something uh, that's of interest. So let's begin. Uh, first, uh, the very exciting news, uh, Metaflow for R uh, was open sourced just this past Tuesday. Uh, so uh, you guys are one of the first people to get a look at uh, what Metaflow is all about in the R universe. And um, up top, Metaflow uh, is a platform for data science projects. Uh, it was built at Netflix. We have been using Metaflow for all sorts of uh, machine learning and data science projects for the last uh, almost three years. Uh, almost all of machine learning at Netflix, uh, except for recommendations, uh, uses uh, Metaflow. And um, in today's uh, workshop, the agenda, uh, the high level overview is that um, I'll cover what was the motivation for us to build Metaflow and uh, when should you be using Metaflow? When should you be considering looking at Metaflow? And then my colleagues, Jason and Brian, will take you on a hands-on session. We'll, they'll take you through a case study and uh, they'll take a business problem and identify some of the issues uh, that you might run into uh, in a day-to-day -day fashion and how can Metaflow essentially help you uh, get over that? So now, before, before we begin talking about Metaflow, it's, it's really helpful to understand why did we even build Metaflow, right? Uh, why, what was the motivation for us? Now, when people think about uh, machine learning and Netflix, uh, the very first thing that jumps out uh, is our recommendation system, right? So, uh, for a lot of you who might uh, have subscribed to our service, when you log into Netflix, uh, you see a whole bunch of TV shows that are all customized to your tastes and preferences. And we have been investing very heavily in that area for well over a decade now. But now as Netflix became a global company, as it became a studio by itself and it started producing more and more content, there were a lot of different areas where we had to invest 
when it came to data science. Uh, you know, areas like how do we properly value any piece of IP that we look at, uh, say, you know, we need to produce a TV show or a movie, then there needs to be somebody who needs to figure out that if, you know, like this TV show is worth these many dollars. And uh, we use a lot of data science to guide our decisioning around that. Uh, to make sure that you know your viewing experience is optimal, uh, we do a lot of research around video algorithms, audio algorithms, uh, figuring out how to cache our content as close to you geographically as possible, and we use a lot of machine learning uh, to enable that as well. Uh, predicting the quality of network, uh, we spend heavily on marketing our titles uh, to you. Uh, there's, there's a big uh, experimentation framework as well, uh, which is primarily driven by R. So we are big on causal inference as well. So you can, you can see that we have a diverse set of use cases uh, that people inside of Netflix are working on. And uh, which means that our data scientists, they come from a diverse set of backgrounds as well. Uh, they have uh, skills in Python as well as skill sets in R. And, when my team, the machine learning infrastructure team, went about uh, building a platform for them, uh, at that point in time, uh, we had to make sure that our platform could cater well uh, to the users who were in the Python universe, as well as uh, the users in the R universe. And uh, Metaflow is uh, essentially that platform. And uh, here we are today uh, talking to you about it. Now, let me walk you through what a life cycle of a data science project in R looks like uh, from a very high level. And uh, this will essentially also highlight some of the problems that uh, we definitely run into day to day and hopefully you would also have experienced at some point. Uh, so, you know, most of the data science projects, they start out in some sort of an IDE uh, in the R universe, uh, R Studio, uh, is uh, really popular. A lot of people uh, use Jupyter Notebooks with R kernels, or maybe, you know, you just use Vim, Emacs, uh, some other ID. And when you first start uh, solving a business problem, uh, the work is very exploratory. It's very experimental in nature. You're constantly looking at newer data sets. You're constantly tweaking your algorithms, tweaking your approach. And there is a lot of back and forth movement. Uh, there might be certain things that uh, seem promising and go forward with them, then once you've generated your results, then it might turn out that, okay, you know, maybe you need to take a step back and try out a different idea, maybe a different set of parameters. And as it happens, there, there is a very strong need uh, to maintain some sort of a history so that you can very easily move between versions of your own work. And data science is rather interesting because when it comes to this notion of uh, version history, it's not just the code that we're talking about. We're talking about your data. We are talking about uh, your results uh, as well. And that's, that's really, really important at the end of the day, because even when it comes to you know, collaborating uh, with other people, uh, if you are able to keep a version history of your own work, then other people at least have a notion of figuring out like, okay, you know, like uh, what sort of progress have you made? Uh, can they actually repeat uh, the kind of experiments that you have run? And in this space, there are many excellent tools, uh, you know, like MLflow happens to be one that allows uh, very explicit metrics tracking, very explicit code tracking, data tracking. Uh, but at the end of the day, as an end user, when you're doing your work, uh, what's really important is that you're just focusing on the task at hand and you don't have to think about uh, versioning your code every single time you execute. Say, you know, uh, maybe you're familiar with Git, uh, but you wouldn't want to do a git commit every single time you're executing uh, your code uh, because then even if you miss out uh, doing that git commit uh, even once then you have sort of like lost that history so it's a it was really essential for us to uh, build a framework that was taking care of versioning as a first class concern and it was versioning not just the code uh, but the data and the results uh, that the users have as well now once you have some idea about you know, how you're going to uh, version your experiments, uh, version your work, then very often, you know, uh, a lot of times people run into this issue uh, where they need to uh, scale out their compute. And scaling can mean a lot of different things. 
uh, maybe you're using a data frame and now all of a sudden that data frame doesn't fit um, in, on your laptop. Now there are multiple different ways uh, that you can tackle that. Maybe you use a more efficient approach of processing those data frames on your laptop, say, you know, using data table or using deep dive. At times, you just need to have a much bigger uh, machine to process that data set because even deep dive and uh, data table uh, might have uh, resource requirements that far exceed the ones that you have on your laptop. At times, you might want to say, train a machine learning model using GPUs, and you might not have access to those GPUs on your laptop. And so, so how, how would you go about doing that? And unfortunately, uh, the R community today, they don't have very many good resources to interface effectively with cloud. Say, you know, you had a way of very easily just like taking your compute and uh, putting that onto a much bigger instance on say uh, Amazon's cloud or Google's cloud, then, then it would be much more easier and productive for you to do your work. And uh, in the Python universe, there are a whole bunch of tools that are available, but then in the R universe, uh, we're still sort of like making progress on that end. And uh, as I said uh, before, right, like you can use, say, uh, data table dplyr to be a little bit more efficient in terms of your data processing needs. Uh, maybe you can translate your code uh, into Sparklier uh, so that you can distribute your compute. But all of that essentially, uh, at the end of the day, requires some changes in your code. And it's just not productive. If, if there was a very simple and easy way for you to just like take the code that you have and very transparently execute on a much bigger instance on the cloud, uh, then you would end up being far more productive. And uh, that's that's something that we try to make sure that Metaflow uh, is capable of doing. Now, one point uh, is that, you know, Reticulate is an amazing project that has made uh, the Python universe very easily accessible. So now you have like all sorts of cloud APIs that you can very easily just access through Reticulate, uh, but still, uh, Getting uh, things set up on the cloud, making sure that you can very efficiently interface with the cloud data store. You can launch multiple jobs. You can figure out, you know, how to move results from cloud to your laptop and all. That still requires a lot of heavy lifting. And uh, today, later uh, in this workshop, uh, as we go through the case study, uh, we'll walk you through around how Metaflow essentially takes care of that. Yet another concern that a lot of folks have uh, is around this notion of uh, accurate and timely uh, getting their results. Now, uh, there, there is this notion that you know a lot of R code is experimental in nature, but then at times it's it's generating really valuable results and insights uh, for your business stakeholders, and there is often a need where uh, you would just want to make sure that you know your workflow executes reliably on time. Uh, at a given schedule, say, you know, uh, you, every single time your data set updates, you'd want to re-trigger your analysis, or uh, you might want to redo your analysis, say, you know, like every Sunday night, so that the business stakeholders, when they walk into uh, the office on Monday morning, they have the fresh uh, set of results. Now, up until now, there hasn't been an easy way for our users to schedule their code. Uh, you can definitely use cron. Uh, to schedule the code on your laptop. Uh, but then again, you know, there could be scenarios where you might just want a better uh, monitoring or alerting functionality so that when things fail, you are like meaningfully alerted and then you can take some sort of like collective action and figure out how to debug. Uh, there are a bunch of workflow orchestrators uh, in the open source like Airflow, et cetera. Uh, but now the problem with them is that uh, they don't provide a native R API. So you have to essentially shoehorn your code and you also have to understand what their Pythonic API uh, or what their custom DSL is uh, at the end of the day to get your work done, uh, which again, uh, hampers productivity. And all of these issues were issues that we saw internally at Netflix as well. So it was very important for us to build something so that our end users at the end of the day, they can focus on what they really love, uh, which is doing data science and not necessarily focus a lot on these infrastructural and engineering concerns. And that was the result uh, of uh, that exercise where we built Metaflow, where uh, we take uh, strong opinions on the lower levels of the data science stack. So, you know, for example, when it comes to how do we arrange data in the data warehouse, or how do we schedule your compute on the cloud? Uh, how is your code actually versioned? Uh, these, these are the things uh, 
that our data scientists would like the platform to do on their behalf. Uh, but then when it comes to exercising their opinions on uh, what sort of libraries they want to use, how do they want to do uh, feature engineering, for example, uh, that's, that's where they would want to exercise uh, their own opinions. Uh, and uh, so, so we took a very human-centric approach uh, and we created this R package uh, which essentially uh, then allows uh, data scientists uh, to just like focus on their uh, work. Now, when is Metaflow a good match? Uh, you know, like when, when should you be looking at Metaflow as sort of like uh, part of your tool set? Uh, and as, as I mentioned before, right, like uh, here, here are sort of like these three questions. And uh, if your answer is yes to any of these, uh, then Metaflow uh, can definitely be helpful. Say, you know, if you have multiple collaborators on a, one single project, or if you have multiple moving pieces and the project is like very complex and you want to keep track of like different uh, states, uh, then definitely take a look at Metaflow. Or if you want to very easily uh, offload your compute to the cloud, uh, use say, you know, Amazon's S3 as the cloud data store. Uh, essentially, anytime you start pushing uh, the infrastructure limits of your own laptop, uh, then Metaflow can be a good match at that point in time. Or if you have any uh, sort of like constraints around making sure that your results are produced in a timely manner and you can offload the execution uh, of your code uh, to say a workflow uh, executor, in, in all of those cases, Metaflow uh, can be a good match. Uh, but of course, you know, there are plenty of instances where you need none of these. Uh, maybe, you know, you just want to have rapid prototyping on one single laptop. And there are very excellent projects out there uh, that you can take a look at, uh, Drake being uh, one of them. So in today's session, uh, my colleagues, um, Jason and Brian, uh, they'll walk you through a hypothetical business problem. Where we'll take uh, some publicly available data sets and we'll try to predict uh, housing prices uh, in various neighborhoods. And uh, through that case study, uh, we'll essentially walk you through like, okay, what would it look like solving uh, this problem outside the scope of Metaflow? What are some of the problems that people might run into uh, from uh, an architectural standpoint when you have to actually solve a business problem and make sure that you know, uh, your thing runs effectively end to end? And then we'll uh, talk about how can we introduce Metaflow uh, in terms of solving this business problem and uh, how can it be helpful at the end of the day? Now, this session today, you know, it's it's a long session, uh, close to two, two and a half hours long. Uh, the key takeaway uh, for today's session uh, from our viewpoint uh, is that uh, today's session is not really meant to be an exhaustive overview of Metaflow. We're not going to cover every single feature that Metaflow has, uh, but the session is more geared towards uh, getting you introduced to Metaflow uh, so that then uh, it's easier for you to dive into our documentation and uh, sort of like reason about our programming model. And um, I, I want to sort of like make it clear here, Metaflow is not supposed to replace any of your existing tooling uh, that you might already be familiar with. Uh, it's, it's a complementary tool uh, in your stack. Uh, it's supposed to help you be more productive with the tools that you already uh, love and use. And yes, you know, it goes without, without saying, uh, please have fun. Uh, if at any point in time uh, you run into any issues, uh, we have ample support available in Zoom Q&A uh, as well as on our GitHub channels. Now, before I leave uh, you, uh, there's one thing that I want to highlight. Uh, in today's session, we are going to talk a lot about interfacing with the cloud, uh, uh, offloading your compute onto uh, AWS instances. And we understand that, you know, at times it can be really difficult to meaningfully get access to an AWS account. So we have created these sandboxes uh, that you can actually go ahead and request uh, at metaflow.org slash sandbox uh, by logging in uh, with your GitHub ID. And uh, we will essentially provision you an isolated uh, AWS environment uh, with all the resources set up. And this is all complimentary paid for by Netflix. And you can essentially test your own code, uh, your own data sets um, on these sandboxes and uh, experience uh, all the features that Metaflow provides. And uh, if you run into any issues at any time after this workshop, we have ample documentation available at uh, docs.metaflow.org. 
uh, and the entire development team is available round the clock at chat.devro.org for live support. And with this, uh, I'll pass on to Jason for a deep dive on Metaflow. Okay, thanks. Thanks so much to Saving for the uh, for the great introduction and great to meet you meet you guys over this virtual conference. Uh, let me share my screen right now. Um, so sharing screen. Okay. Deep dive. Okay, so I'm getting started from here. Uh, let me just turn turn on my notes. Um, okay. Um, by the way, I cannot really see the chats. Uh, so I can see the guitar channel. So if you have questions, if you post on the guitar, I should be able to see them. Um, and yeah, so uh, this is meant to be a deeper dive. Uh, Brent and I are gonna uh, talk through a case study to, uh, to basically um, introduce Metaflow in, uh, with the greater details. Um, so today's agenda for this deep dive section is first of all, we're going to talk about why R, why do we really care about R uh, at Netflix? And then secondly, we want to go through a case study to uh, introduce uh, what's the motivation for, for Metaflow at Netflix. And, um, and then we're going to talk about how Metaflow can help with the case study. And if we have more time, we can chat more about uh, Metaflow, the additional features on fault tolerant and um, production ready features. So, Without further ado, let's start with the first section, why R? Um, as Evan has um, um, introduced earlier in the in in presentation, we open sourced the Python package earlier last year, uh, December 2000, uh, 2019, um, and just, in, just open sourced the R package uh, one week ago. So it's, uh, it's on GitHub, uh, Netflix, Metaflow repo. So pretty exciting for us. Um, this is why we really um, we're really excited about R and Netflix. So first of all, uh, R has this very nice tidyverse uh, package system. And um, basically you have packages for data IO, data, uh, data cleaning, data wrangling, uh, visualization, modeling, and, um, and, and uh, the final presentation, communication. You know, they have R Markdown and Shiny App. And also, uh, we have a very nice data science-oriented IDE, R Studio in R. This is uh, this is really great because you have uh, you have the editor, you have the R console, you have the variable explorer, and you have visualization, um, help docs, file directory, all, all everything together in the in in, um, in in the same panel, which is really really nice. Um, and and also. Um, it's, it's very powerful to have this interactive visualization. Um, our Shiny app. Um, and, and also very importantly, R has a very rich libraries for statistical computing. So, um, and, and those libraries are also cutting edge because uh, most of the statistic academic community like to publish their research on R, on CRAN actually. Um, so if you, if you need something um, for variable selection, statistical inference, causal inference, survival modeling, or non-parametric regression, or some other more advanced topics, R would really be the go-to place uh, because it already has some very uh, advanced and nice libraries um, uh, available to you off the shelf on CRAN. So inside Netflix, we have this big experiment, uh, experimentation platform where we run A-B tests all the time. And, um, and in, in our XP platform, we have, uh, we, have causal, we have causal models and visualization, and we use R for causal inference and Netflix, and we use Shiny App for visualization. So this is a technology, uh, this is a blog post on our technology blog. It's, uh, uh, it's on Medium, you can check it out if you're interested. Okay, now let's go through a case study to get together to talk about why Metaflow. Um, yeah, so 
before we start with the uh, case study, let's uh, let's download the tutorial contents here. So we have the tutorial uh, wrapped up in um, in the repo. It's actually an, an R package. Um, you can download from from um, from GitHub using DevTools. Uh, let's do it together. Yeah. So this is my this is my um, R Studio. You will just do DevTools GitHub uh, install GitHub. Um, yeah, I think it 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 will also be great if uh, some other panelists can just copy paste the command on the chat in um, in Zoom or Gitter, so it's easier for everyone to uh, just copy paste. Um, is there a twenty twenty Metaflow tutorial dependency equals true? So we're gonna install it. Just one moment, uh, we're pulling. So it's telling me my data table dependency is outdated, um, not updating for now, just to save some time. And yes, so you see we have this uh, new package and you can do pull tutorials. Well, uh, so this command will actually pull the tutorial content into the current working directory. So, okay, so you see I'm having this new folder. So um, I have, uh, actually we have um, uh, five episodes from zero to four for our tutorial. Um, episode one, um, episode one is, uh, is a baseline um, R project. It's using vanilla R. And then um, in episode one, we'll first go through episode one in the case study. And um, let's go back to the slides. Um, yep. So once everything, uh, once once we have pulled the tutorials in in our current working directory, um, that we can check out the um, the the uh, structure of the tutorial folder. Basically, as I said, uh, to episode one is for the case study with vanilla R, and we also do a preview of Metaflow um, inside the case study. And um, the previews will be previews of episode one, two, three, four. And then, uh, and later on in this workshop, uh, we'll go into uh, episode one, two, three, four. And we'll, uh, with each of this episode, we're gonna introduce some of the key features of Metaflow. And um, basically we'll do uh, like a hands-on, uh, we'll do this in a hands-on fashion. Uh, um, we'll basically uh, try to modify the script together from episode zero to one, to two, to three, to four. Uh, we're gonna um, basically introduce the features in a, in a hands-on fashion. But don't worry if you can't really follow. If you can follow, then that's great. If you have questions, feel uh, feel free to type in the chat or in the guitar. If you can't really, if you can't follow, then that's fine. Um, you can just go to go to each of the episode and run um run um the scripts in those episodes because that these episodes are like milestones or snap or, or checkpoints uh, over our entire editing um, process. So you can directly. Uh, go to each of the episode and um, and try it out. And um, yeah, so let's check if our tutorials will work fine. Um, let's do this in our studio. Uh, mm, I'll go into this folder and episode zero. And I'll let's just run this run the R. Let's take a look. Um, let's take a brief look at what this script do. So, so, so this this script actually stores um, the other modeling script and and then uh, data wrangling script inside this folder, and it's running the computation one by one. So I'll come to back the come back to this later. So we're running this just to make just as a sanity check that we have installed the uh, tutorial properly. Okay. So today we're gonna to talk about the case study on the housing price prediction. The data set looks like this. So we have this, um, uh, we have, we have this uh, CSV file where uh, we want to predict the price of the um, historical transaction of house in Seattle area from 2014 and 2015. And um, um, the features we're gonna, the raw features we're gonna use are uh, some of the attributes of the house, for example, number of bedrooms, number of bathrooms, square feet living, square feet lot, and then um, number of floors and then waterfront and some other attributes. So the raw data are in a data folder, raw house data.csv. So this is, um, um, 
yeah, so this is the raw data and um, it looks like this. We're gonna use these columns to predict this column. So uh, our case study actually has uh, uh, four steps. The first step, in the first step, we're gonna build the first model with baseline vanilla R and then uh, we'll uh, iterate on the features and models. And then we'll talk about how to scale out parameter search. And finally, we'll, come, we'll talk about uh, what's the process for sharing results. So I want to mention that uh, in all of the four steps, these are all in vanilla R. Um, we don't actually use Metaflow yet. So this is episode zero. The goal of doing this, uh, going through these four steps is to introduce some of the problems that we want to solve with Metaflow. For example, experiment tracking, version control, very importantly, scaling out to AWS, our cloud integration, and data management reproducibility. And um, yeah, and then uh, after each step, I will do a, um, a quick preview of, our, of the Metaflow uh, solution to each of the problem. And, then, and, um, and after the case study, we'll properly come back to Metaflow, introduction of Metaflow, and then we'll talk about how each of the Metaflow feature uh, actually tackle some of the pain points. So uh, this is how Metaflow actually uh, think about the problem we mentioned here. Um, you can see we have this stack here. Well, on the upper level, we have model development, feature engineering, and the lower stacks we have data warehouse, compute resource orchestration, job scheduling, architecture versioning. So we have, we have observed that uh, data scientists care more about this upper stacks and less about the lower stacks, but there's a lot of infrastructure needed for the lower stacks, especially if you want to have a robust uh, cloud, native, cloud native solution. Um, if you want to orchestrate and run things reliably with AWS, then there's a, a lot of infrastructure work needed for the lower level. So um, Metaflow focuses on the lower levels. And uh, um, by doing that, we allow data scientists to move very fast, very quickly on the top, top levels, mostly top two levels. And uh, this is how we are thinking about these problems um, uh, mentioned here for a typical data science lifecycle. Okay, let's just um, um, start with uh, step one. Um, in step one, we're building the first model with a vanilla R. This is just um, a baseline R. So R is uh, really great at uh, data wrangling and experimentation. So, um, so basically we have uh, three scripts here, pool uh, house price. We you will call this function to create this house price .csv. Um, in the, uh, So this, this script does a little bit data cleaning and then um, it read from the raw data, does some data cleaning, save the data here and then we compute features, and based on the features, we build models, and we save model locally. Um, yeah, so this is how we build the model. Let's do it uh, with the Art Studio. Yeah, you see we are in this folder. We're in the right place, episode zero. Um, let's just go through episode zero and make sure that everything looks good. Scripts, uh, let's source all the files. We need this, um, scripts. Uh, need compute features. Need another one, which is pool data, I think. Yeah. Okay, so uh, let's first call the pool house data and then um, it's gonna pull this uh, data file. This is how the, um, the data looks like after data cleaning. Let's briefly check out these, um, this, this script. Um, so we're reading from the raw data and uh, there's a little bit data cleaning goes on. And then, uh, for example, we're making zip code into a character instead of uh, integers, and then we're, we're throwing out some columns as irrelevant. This is basically just a very simple data cleaning. And then, um, and then we'll compute features. Um, compute features from this. Yep. So now we have some feature files. So I want to briefly talk about the features that we're trying to trying to compute. Um, first of all, we want to we, we want to combine on the number of uh, bedrooms and number of bathrooms. So that's why we're doing this uh, cross uh, cross product of these two columns, and also condition uh, and living. Um, another type of features are parameterized features. So this idea is that we want to check the uh, average uh, square feet living per room. But we have bedroom and bathroom. So we know that bathroom is a little bit smaller, but we're not really sure how much weight we should put here. 
Um, so that's why we have three uh, features with different parameters. We're, we're gonna come back and tune those parameters later. And we have uh, three other additional features. So these are the feature file. You see I'm, uh, I'm saving the feature file here um, with uh, write.csv just to make sure that even if my R Studio crash with some um, bug, then I won't uh, would, then I, I won't lose the intermediate results. I could just restart my R Studio and and load the CSV and continue my experiment. Um, and then uh, let's let's build some model. Yeah, so it's a building model right now. Let's take a look at the script. Um, Pretty simple. Uh, this is X, uh, this is Y, because our prediction targeted price. So we're using um, all the columns that's not priced to as the attributes, and this is the target. So we're training the model, um, and calling, we're calling this trend GBM model um, function from this um, uh, model script. And uh, we're printing or printing a summarization of the model, and, and we're saving the model locally to this folder. Um, saved models, yeah. So you see uh, the name of the model, uh, we actually, yeah, we actually using um, um, number 100 learning rate 0 0.01 as uh, part of the file name because our, uh, because our model building process has parameters as well. So we want to make sure that uh, when we're looking at the local model file, we know exactly uh, what parameters we used to train this model. And then we can see uh, in this model script, uh, we actually, by default, we have n here set by here. And this is learning rate set by here. Uh, they have some default value. When I was building model previously, I, don't, I didn't set any default value. But we can tune this, uh, we can tune this parameters later on. Yes, so uh, this, is, this is great. This is a vanilla R, nothing Metaflow yet. Um, yeah, so just want to pause here and see if people have questions. Okay, yeah, let's, let me move on. I can't really see the chats, but uh, there's nothing in Gitter going on. So I'm gonna just move on. Yeah, the second step is about iterating on the features on our features and models. Um, yeah, so the idea is that as you, as you saw before, we have parameters for the features, we have parameters for the models. Uh, we would, sometimes we want to try different versions of features and different versions of models. So sometimes they're just parameters and sometimes they introduce, you, some, you want to introduce new ideas in the features or you want to introduce a, a new model. Just to simplify the case, the case study, I'm just uh, um, tuning the parameters in, dish, in different scripts. So the problem here is that uh, when we're tuning the parameter, we're gonna end up with a different version of the script, compute features and the model, uh, build model scripts. We will have, uh, we ha we'll have different uh, intermediate, um, um, intermediate results files, and uh, we're gonna need to save different uh, file names in save model uh, directory. Um, let's quickly do that in RStudio. So compute features. Um, let's say I want uh, I want a different parameter here, and um, now make sure the features v two. So I had a I had a previous one. Uh, I used that one as v one. So I'm now creating a different feature set. Features v two compute features. Yeah, and now I'm building models. Uh, I want to try a different parameter for the model as well. Um, then, then um, yeah, so then this, I need to change this to make sure that uh, I, will, I don't overwrite the previous model file because uh, I'm building model with a different parameter. Um, yeah, and, and we're also using a different feature set. So I need to do this features v2, um, let me save this. v2 build model um, features v2. Yeah, as you can see, I have to, uh, every time I, I, I try something new with, the, with some ideas, 
um, either either new feature ideas or new model ideas, uh, I have to somehow change the file names and variable names for my uh, for my variables in the um, in R Studio and also for the intermediate data set, the name of the data set. So I can um, I can I can know uh, exactly which data correspond to which ideas that I tried previously, um, and that's that's kind of it's kind of annoying and um, uh, the problem is. Yeah, so it's even more problematic if, for example, when you're in a uh, different, if you're in a new version of compute features, um, you try something new, but you, but you forget to change the variable name or you forget to change the uh, actual local file name and you would accidentally overwrite on the previous results. So uh, you override it and then, uh, and you something was wrong, you figure out something, you notice something was wrong, but you're not sure what, and then uh, you change the file name and you build the models and then at this time, uh, your features v1 actually uh, actually got, is out of sync with the previous version one. So this is a, this is a pretty big problem because it's gonna create a lot of uh, bugs and uh, annoyances when you are prototyping. Um, yeah. So it's it's, it's overwriting is pre, uh, is particularly annoying when you hit a um, hit a bug and hit an error in build model. For example, if your if your new feature idea uh, is not that great, it introduces some, for example, highly correlated features, and then um, your model building would crash. And um, and at that time, if you want to switch back to the um, um, previous feature set, you'd uh, you're probably a little bit hesitant because you're not sure if the previous feature set, uh, feature v1, is still in sync with the pre uh, version one of the compute feature scripts. So what you ended up having to do is recomputing the full thing from scratch, so that you know that um, I have uh, I have everything uh, in sync. So uh, yeah, so recomputing from scratch is pretty annoying, especially when you have uh, multiple stages and you hit an hit a bug, hit an error in the final stage. So yeah, so this is uh, these are the problems. Uh, uh, for, for these problems in iterating uh, features and models, uh, people really have to track models and features versions using a spreadsheet. Uh, so MLflow offers something like this, which is pretty nice. Um, you would basically be able to see um, for every run, uh, they auto you can automatically log this into a spreadsheet um, in ML, ML, MLflow. If people don't use MLflow, then have to do it manually. So this whole thing is pretty um, time consuming. And Drake also offers a very nice solution, um, um, basically to convert the whole workflow into, a, uh, in, into this kind of a DAC. And then uh, Drake is taking care of the versioning. And if you hit, an, um, hit a bug in the final stage, like if you hit a bug in report, Drake can help, can help you resume from the previous two stages using the data that's uh, that's created in the two stages, and then Draco is taking care of the data management and make sure everything is up to date. So uh, we have some nice tools in our community right now to tackle these problems. So Metaflow does this as well. So if you're familiar with Drake, uh, so the concept of DAG should be uh, familiar as well. So this is how in Metaflow we uh, actually construct the DAG. Um, don't worry about this, uh, a lot of code here. It's actually pretty simple. Uh, so you, you see there, these are just a, a bunch of steps. In each step, you specify the step name, um, the next step, the name of the next step, and in the, in the middle, you specify an R function, which is the function that you want to execute for that step. So uh, here, this is the Metaflow DAG. So the first step, you uh, execute the first function, second step, the second function, and so on. And uh, very interesting about Metaflow is that um, uh, similar to Drake, we are uh, we are capturing the code and data together in each of the steps for each run. Uh, so every time you run the script, we will create a new data object called the step, and inside that data object, you will have data on the of the code, and you have data on the on everything created inside this uh, R function. So um, and for every new run, we will uh, refresh this, um, and. And this is this is how Metaflow can help for uh, for this problem of um, 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 model tracking and data management. I'll come back to this later in uh, in the next section. So this is only a quick preview of how Metaflow can help. OK, 
Okay, so do we have questions? Okay, so I don't see anything on Gitter. Um, let me just move on for now. Okay, um, yeah, so the step three is scaling out parameter search. Um, as you can see, we have parameters for the models and features. Some of times these parameters are really important. For example, the learning rates of, uh, uh, of uh, um, uh, GBM models, um, the learning rate is really critical for how your model performs. So people like to do parameter search all the time. And, then, um, and um, if, if sometimes your model is kind of big or your, if your data set is big and you cannot run a lot of parameter search in parallel on your laptop, then what people really like to do is to parallelize this in a managed cluster. For example, Slur, if they are not using AWS. So uh, what people do is that they have to write a script to submit parallel jobs to a managed cluster from their laptop. And, uh, but uh, this approach is kind of, uh, it's kind of annoying. I, I think it, uh, uh, it includes a lot of DevOps work because you need to think about how to copy the feature sets or the raw data to the remote machines because you're submitting a job to a bunch of remote machines. These remote machines are not yours in the beginning. They got allocated to you by, uh, by the central cluster. So when they get allocated to you, it's just a new machine. It has nothing there. You have to somehow figure out a way to copy the project into the machine, copy the data. The data is sometimes very big and then the copying process can take long. If you're lucky, your cluster has this network file system. Um, and in that case, uh, the cluster can directly read from your local directory, which is nice. Um, and um, yeah, and after your training finish, you need to think about where to write the training results. Because um, you, you may have 100 instances working and then uh, when the training finish, uh, you need to ask each of them to write the training results, for example, the safe model back to somewhere. Uh, the problem is you somehow need to manage the right path for each instances and for each experiment. And then it's very important to, to avoid overwriting past results. And uh, it's important to uh, make sure that the instances don't overwrite each other. Uh, this, this is also a lot of DevOps work. Uh, it's error prone as well. And, um, and also you have to somehow keep the modeling script and the uh, um, CPU RAM resource requirements uh, um, script in sync. So modeling script is uh, your R functions and then and, and this script is about how you submit stuff to the managed cluster. Uh, you may need to uh, tune something for the cluster depending on the, how long the queue is, for example, max uh, wait time. Um, but, but those stuff, uh, yeah, so, but those stuff are hard to, it's, it's kind of not that, that easy to keep modeling script and this requirements in sync. Um, yeah, and, and, um, and it's also very painful to know um, how um, just, it's, it's kind of not very easy for people to know um, how long the wait time is gonna be for the cluster. And if your flow is mission critical, for example, um, um, if you're deploying this flow in production and then um, your company's customer relying on this model, then you need to make sure that the model can uh, get trained reliably every week. Um, so you don't want to get stuck in a scenario where your model is waiting in the queue for a long time and somehow um, and some random exception occurred and you cannot handle this exception. Uh, maybe like, for example, uh, could be some uh, internet connection timeouts. So if you waited for too long. And the, the question is how do you programmatically handle this, this kind of platform exception such as timeouts? This is also pretty uh, non-trivial to do if your model is deployed in production. Yeah, all of this is just DevOps, um, a lot of uh, model operations and development operations. And uh, none of these are data science, but we just want to focus on data science and then uh, the DevOps are taking too much time for us. And uh, this is a pre quick preview of how Metaflow can help. Um, if you can still, if you still remember how we specify the step uh, in our flow before, we have this step where we have step name, the next, uh, uh, the name for next step and our function. So it's very easy for us to um, scale things to the cloud. We only need to add a decorator here. Say we're running on AWS batch compute environments. We need four CPU 
and eight gigs of RAM. And we just need to add the decorator here inside your current script. There's no need for change for your R function, no need to change elsewhere. And then here uh, in the previous step, compute features you specify for each variable. The for each variable um, take um, basically take a list of parameters that you want to search over with. And uh, when you run this, when you run this, uh, we will actually start five instances on AWS and each of them running the same, uh, same, uh, same code on build model, build GBM model. And then, um, and we will assign these parameters to each of the instances. So they will be building model with different parameters. And when they finish, they're gonna, the results are gonna be read from the next step. So the point I want to make here is that it's really easy in Metaflow to scale a local mode, uh, to, to scale any local flow to, um, to a cloud flow. So we're gonna demo this um, in maybe 10 minutes. So, um, so it's pretty exciting feature for us. Um, I think this is, uh, is probably one of the best features of, uh, uh, of Metaflow because it's uh, literally turned my laptop into a supercomputer. So uh, it, it, for me, the, the development experience would feel like uh, the same as uh, uh, running locally. So I would just run the same script as you can see later. When, when you can just run the same script, uh, you can see the result printing, printing out on your console in our studio, but actually the code is getting run in AWS on any machine that you want to specify. If, you're, if you have a big data, uh, if, if your data set is really big, you can specify up to uh, uh, 96 gigs of, uh, um, no, it's, you can specify up to two terabytes of RAM on AWS. So that's the biggest instance AWS has right now. And you can specify hundreds of CPUs for each of the instances. And, um, um, and you can have hundreds of instances running at the same time. And it feels like it's just running on your laptop. So, uh, so this, um, this kind of experience is really great. And um, yeah, so I'll come back to this later. And yep. So, um, and after you're, uh, you're done with um, um, parameter search and you're back, you're, you're back to sharing without section. Um, so, uh, yeah, so we have a great model here. We want to share results with our colleagues. Um, so first of all, um, we wonder what's the, what's the right way to share our results with colleagues for just for simple inspection. For example, my colleague wants to inspect my features and final model files. How do I share them? So my features can be quite big. They can be hundreds of gig uh, gigabits. Uh, I can't cannot share by Dropbox, <laughs> so uh, it's uh, and even if, for example, I share them with AWS S3, I want to keep them updated on on my work. So I'm uh, I'm updating the features all the time, and then uh, I want them to have access to my most up to date features all the time. It's not clear how do I share them. I cannot just give them access to my uh, machine and folder because. Uh, when they're inspecting my local files, they may accidentally change some uh, change something, and uh, that's also quite inconvenient for them to log into another machine. So and and also when they uh, when they when they write when my colleague writes an inspection notebook, uh, for example, some visualization, and they has a point on how my feature looks kind of uh, off. Maybe I have a, a heavy tail distribution that's uh, indicating a bad feature. My colleague wants to share back with me a notebook. Uh, the question is, uh, how does he share this back with me? So if he just sent me the notebook, uh, the notebook runs on my colleague's computer, not on my computer, because the notebook is reading, uh, definitely reading data from uh, like a local file directory. And the local file directory works on my colleague's laptop and doesn't, um, doesn't work on my laptop computer. Uh, so it's not easy to, for my colleague to share a notebook back with me so I can reproduce and run um, in my laptop as well. So uh, yeah, so this process is kind of pretty um, non-trivial, I would say. And if my colleagues need to reproduce the whole workflow, I need to write instructions on how to run each script in certain order with different arguments. So this, uh, this itself is kind of uh, not easy because you need to also write about uh, the dependencies, the environment, and then uh, if you are updating the scripts, you need to update the, the instructions as well. So uh, all of this is kind of pretty time consuming and error prone. So this is a preview of how Metaflow can help. 
so Metaflow actually maintains a global data store of all past runs for all teammates. So you can see instead of sharing results with each other, uh, all of the Metaflow users write uh, their data and code to a global data store. So, um, so you, um, if you just download Metaflow, you're running locally. Um, your data store is uh, just inside your laptop. If you're just developing in solo mode, if you're collaborating with your colleagues, uh, we have a, a guide to set up this global data store on AWS. So uh, as long as uh, we both have access to this global data store, then um, every teammate is gonna uh, write data and code to this um, data store on AWS. And, um, and each user has their own, each user has their own namespace. Uh, when they execute the run, the run is gonna produce data and code. The code and data, they uh, live in their own namespace. You won't accidentally overwrite uh, a teammate's work. So you can um, uh, feel safe that everything happens in your own namespace is properly isolated from teammates to teammate. Um, and uh, if you want to inspect your teammates' results, you just need to uh, switch your namespace. We provide a way in Metaflow to, um, um, to give you uh, a way to explicitly switch namespace. And then, um, and then you can switch uh, namespace to your colleague's namespace, and then you can inspect the previous results uh, in an immutable manner. So you can read a, uh, you can read a pass wrong, you can read data from pass wrong, but uh, you won't be able to modify it. So we're saving everything on AWS S3 in an uh, immutable manner. Yeah, so I'll just quickly stop here and then see if we have questions. Um, okay, so looking at Gitter because I cannot see chats when I'm in presentation mode. Um, okay, nothing happening on Gitter. So let me just move on. Okay, so this is the uh, case study coming to a full, full cycle. And then again, these are the problems we want to solve with Metaflow, this experiment tracking, version control, scaling out to AWS, data management, and reproducibility. So all of this are just DevOps and model operations and uh, how to make the whole thing production ready. But as a data scientist, we only want to focus on the data science part and uh, the, all the other things are are not really uh, something we want, we want to spend time on. And uh, it's pretty frustrating if you, if you get stuck in all this uh, non-data science stuff. Yeah, and then just want to come back to, the, to our philosophy. Uh, we want to take care of Metaflow, want to take care of the lower levels of the stack and then so that the data scientists can uh, move very quickly and iterate very quickly on model development and feature engineering. Um, and this is this is how uh, this is um, um, time to time to first production for data scientists at Netflix. So with Metaflow, we're able to actually get a pro project, any data science project, from um, from prototyping to first production within days, not months. Um, so this is, but but you know, in in real um, in, in in real production, uh, as a, at a company, it's it's really take it will take very long time to get a data science project to production because, because all of the hassles uh, we mentioned ab above and, uh, and the, we didn't even mention how to make things uh, uh, fault tolerant and reliable in the production environment. So that process is, is, is really time consuming as well. So that's why we are having, still having some projects taking very long. But with Metaflow, we can uh, it also, uh, Met with, with Metaflow, the goal is to make time to first production in days but not Okay, so uh, that's it for our case study. Um, the next section, we're gonna be talking about how, uh, how can Metaflow help? And then, um, and um, this is also the end of episode zero. And from, there, from this on, is we're gonna start with episode one, two, three, four. And, um, and if you check out code in this, uh, in this episodes, um, now we have everything or converted into Metaflow. So I'll do this conversion on the fly uh, with, with a demo uh, here with you guys. Um, but don't worry if you cannot follow. If you just, uh, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll basically do a conversion from episode zero to episode one uh, to, to show you how easy it is to convert a, a vanilla R workflow into a Metaflow. 
if you cannot follow, for example, if you have to watch uh, Zoom and uh, do our studio at the same time, it's, I know it's not very easy. If you cannot follow, um, don't worry, just, uh, just go into this uh, script and uh, source this file. You should be able to run everything in Metaflow smoothly. And then, um, yep, so let's, let's go into episode one. Um, okay, so you see, this is our previous workflow uh, in vanilla R. And you can find the scripts in the workshop content folder episode, episode one. Uh, we want to convert this into the scripts in episode one. Yeah, that's, let's do this together. So the first step is uh, uh, we want to chain everything together into, uh, into a DAG. So I showed this previously. Let's just do it. Um, let's just do it, do it together. Uh, let me just first copy this into a, I'll just call this a workspace because I don't want to tamper with the files. Um, okay, so I have workspace here. Um, everything is, uh, so you see this is, this is not in Metaflow. Um, let, me, let me delete this. Uh, first, let's do Meta, uh, make the font, let me make the font bigger. Yeah, first I'll do uh, library Metaflow, and then I'll do Metaflow uh, followed by the name of the flow. So the name of the flow is, the, is very important because uh, this is how you uh, classify different projects uh, um, in our global data store. So, um, yeah, so this is the name of the flow, and then we'll have this this symbol, which is uh, which is a pipe operator where we used to chain steps together. So the first step, uh, let's call this start step. Uh, start step is not doing anything. We just uh, uh, we just use this as the transition. The next step will be pull data. So in pull data, um, in pull data, we need to specify the R function that we need to run. We want to run with this uh, with this step. Um, the R function will be pull house data. Uh, we're going to make some small modification to this um, to this function later on, but this is the this is the script. This is the function we want to use, and then the next step will be compute features. Yeah. By the way, before we're before we're doing this, we want to make we want to make sure that uh, these R functions are visible in this R uh, um, in, in this rondo R. Let me just uh, source all the files uh, that we need because um, we're we're referring to this function. We want to make sure that these things these things are visible. Yep. So and then the rest should be, uh, the rest should be uh, should be the same. You just chain all the steps together. Um, in order to save time, let me just copy paste. Uh, let me just copy paste the uh, run dot r in this episode one. Copy paste. Going back to workspace to run dot r. Uh, yeah. So I'm copy pasting here. Uh, so we were at this step, but uh, just to save time, I'm copy pasting, but the idea is the same. You put two more steps here and you put end step. And very importantly, at the, at the, final, uh, at the final step, you have to put run here. So by doing this, uh, when you're sourcing this file, you're gonna actually run this script. Um, so this script is not yet runnable because the, uh, because the fun we need some final a small touch on the uh, R functions. Uh, let's take a look at the R function. Pull house data. Um, yeah, so we've done this part. Uh, so each step is they, they when they run, they run in an isolated environment. So step is a special concept in Metaflow. Um, so the flow runs in steps and then in each step, we will we will run um, um, we will run tasks. So um, each step runs in an isolated environment. So they can either be a local process or they can be a remote execution. And uh, it's fine that you have some step uh, running locally and some step running on AWS. 
and um, uh, they can they can very easily work together. Um, and this is the idea of step. Uh, it's it's basically um, an isolation idea, and um, and you also need some uh, modularization of your project to put everything into the stack. Um, yeah, so now we're modifying the R functions. The first step is to add the self argument. So all of the Metaflow functions have to have the self argument. So we'll see how, how this is used later on. Let me just add it here. Um, I, think, I think this example is build model. Let me just uh, build model. Okay, it's called build GBM model. I just call this build GBM model. And instead of passing in the data, the previous data frame, I'm passing in self. Self is the, um, is the original flow object. So um, what, el what else I need to do? So I need to uh, make sure this function is functional, fully functional. Um, it can run by itself. It has to take care of the dependencies. So I need to source some files and, and load dependencies. Um, so I need model models to R and I need, I guess I need utils, right? Yes, and then, um, and also load dependency. Yeah, so the reason we have to do this is sometimes we need to run this uh, R function on the cloud. So when we're running on cloud, this function has to take care of all the dependencies because we're, we're using this trend GBM model uh, which is uh, which is implemented in this script, and um, and we're using, for example, the the, the package data dot table, um, and we need to source the we need to uh, we need to import the library in low dependencies, um, and this is uh, dependency. Uh, so the, basically, the R function has to by itself take care of the dependencies, and um, um, this is a core concept of uh, Metaflow, um, and then we have. Uh, so we have this concept called the Metaflow artifacts. Mm, the, the basic idea is that um, all the data created in each step, um, they are saved in as immutable data objects. And we call this saved data object as Metaflow artifact. Um, for example, we're, we're training a model and this function passed back a model data. It's a, um, it's a trained model data. And we are saved, we are saving this model data um, as a Metaflow artifact, the way to create a uh, the way to create a Metaflow artifact is to use this self dollar sign variable syntax. So you can just do this, and you will be uh, saving this model as a uh, immutable data artifact in the uh, AWS Global Data Store or in a, on your local data store. And um, um, yeah, and the way to read uh, uh, and the way to read the data is also very simple. Uh, you see the features are created in the previous step. Uh, we're reading it by just calling self dollar sign features. And um, by doing this, we're reading the features created in the previous step. So this kind of data reading and writing works uh, um, across local and remote. We can come back to that later, but the idea is that even if we're running this on the cloud and then we're running this locally, this should still work. And uh, for example, your model, your model data is created uh, as a Metaflow artifact on um, AWS batch, and you can uh, load back the model in your uh, next step, which runs locally on your laptop. So which this is really nice, and this is possible because we have a global data store on AWS S3. So uh, yeah, and this is the idea of uh, Metaflow artifacts. Let's just convert the, uh, convert the previous script into, uh, to use Metaflow artifacts. Um, so, because we don't have, previously we we're passing in the um, data frame here, but now we don't have it uh, in the function argument. We have, uh, we have our fl uh, flow object here. So we'll just do this. Um, we'll fetch the features created by previous step as a data, as a data table. And uh, this is the same. Um, we're already taking care of this, so I don't need to worry about it. Um, so instead of, because this data is, this model file is something really important when we want to save them for next steps. Um, and by saving, I mean, just creating a, a Metaflow artifact to save this um, um, data object. So I can do fitted model, train GBM model. Um, 
yeah, let's just don't worry about it. And then the best thing is that we don't need to, we don't need to worry about this anymore because uh, the, the, the model is saved as a Metaflow artifact. And then, uh, yeah, so there is no need to saving data locally. And then it's also going to be very clear to us for this model, what kind of features, what kind of uh, parameters we're using for this model. Um, because the model and then the code generated, uh, so the, the data and then the code that generates the data are captured together in a step. So when, when you're looking at the model, you can simply inspect the code to check out what, uh, what actual parameters we're using to generate, uh, to generate this data. Uh, that's the reason why we don't need uh, this kind of file name to capture the parameters or the version of file that we're using, which is really a powerful, powerful feature of Metaflow. Uh, this is part of the data management that we do. Um, I'm just uh, deleting this. I'm also deleting this because I'm summarizing in the next step. Okay, so um, so uh, so this is uh, okay. So there's also no need to return the model anymore. Okay, so this is uh, this is how you convert a uh, non-Metaflow script into a Metaflow script. Very easy, three steps. One, first step is to add self here. Second step is to take care of dependencies. The third step is to uh, take care of data I/O using Metaflow artifacts. And um, yeah, so we're done for the for the first script. To save the time, I'm just gonna copy paste uh, the other script. I'm just gonna copy copy paste other script here uh, in the folder, um, and then the process should be uh, should be exactly the same. Uh, for example, summarize model. We're gonna source the dependencies, and then we're using instead of uh, directly reading from from this prime, uh, from this argument, we are uh, reading from the data artifact created by a previous step. Uh, same, um, yeah, exactly the same steps you need to do to change each of these functions. Um, yes. Um, so to save some time, what I'm, what I'm gonna do is I will simply copy because after the final editing, the workspace should be the same as episode one. Um, we just need to change the other um, R functions um, into uh, into Metaflow. So I'm gonna delete this and then copy this to the workspace. Copy this as the workspace. Yeah. So. Right, so um, this workspace will be basically uh, exactly what it's gonna look like after we are done with the editing for the R functions. And uh, now let's run Metaflow end to end. Um, set working directory, workspace. Yep, exciting. It's the first time we're running Metaflow. You can see that uh, the version of Metaflow um, R 2.2.0 and Python 2.2.0. In the future, the version number may diverge. So Metaflow R is building on top of our Python package. So our Python package is really battle tested. Uh, it's have been using, it has been used widely inside Netflix and also it has been open sourced for almost a, uh, almost a year now. And then um, so our, our package is, um, uh, it's building on top of it, and then by doing this, we can enjoy the uh, reliability provided by the uh, very solid Python package. So the R package is really just a binding for the Python package. You can see when you're running, uh, we're gonna print that the uh, uh, Metaflow is executing the flow name for your user. This is your namespace, um, and then if if you're having some tr if you if you're having problem with uh, um, so, so, so in, a, in some very rare case, your Metaflow may complain that uh, they cannot find the username, proper username. You just need to set uh, the environment variable uh, username or capital um, in R or in your bash. Um, and then and the Metaflow will be able to find the proper username to use to execute your flow. So we have it in our docs Q and A. Um, yeah, so, so while it's still running, you see that we have a, a few stages. Uh, the start step, uh, it's running. Uh, the PID is actually the, the, pro, the ID for the process. As I mentioned before, 
each R function is running in an isolated process. So you don't need to worry about like um, um, one, one process uh, interfere, interfering another process. They are totally isolated. And then the first step, and then you run the second step, whole house data, um, and then the second step, uh, compute features, the fourth step, and then ending. Uh, the end step is um, is uh, an end step is summarizing the model. Uh, so the, the 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 printing format is kind of screwed up, but if I make it smaller, you see it looks much nicer. So um, in order to pre in the presentation mode, I want to make the font bigger. That's why uh, it's kind of look kind of messed up. Um, yeah. So great. So we have the first um, uh, Metaflow flow running end to end. Um, um, so my point is that it just need a, we just need to make some very small changes to a current R project to convert a R project into a Metaflow flow. Uh, just to recap, what you need to do is, uh, first of all, construct this stack using this uh, step, um, uh, using this step syntax and using the pipe um, operator to chain everything together and then modify the R functions. To modify the R functions, there are three things you need to do. First of all, change the arguments to self. Um, and if it's a joint step, it, I'll talk about later. Sometimes it's self, sometimes it should be self and inputs. Um, and, but most often if you're linear flow, just uh, if it's a linear flow, then just use self. This is the first thing. The second thing is to take care of the dependencies uh, to make sure that each of the function, R function can run uh, independently in the, in the R process. And then the third step is to take care of the data IO using Metaflow artifacts. So write the data you think that are important for next steps in, into self dollar sign variable. Um, and then read the data from the self dollar sign variable created in the previous steps. So, um, and that's it. And you should be able to convert your current uh, project into a Metaflow flow. Um, yeah, so running the flow end to end uh, would look like this. So we just did, it uh, works smoothly. And uh, yeah, so here comes the exciting part. Um, we want to run part of this, uh, we want to run part of this on AWS batch. So um, yeah, so before uh, I want to make sure that, uh, I want to make this fun and then for, for, the, for, for you who are still like uh, doing this uh, um, um, uh, demo together with me, uh, we can do this uh, configuring process and then you can configure the uh, AWS sandbox provided by Netflix. So the sandbox runs on AWS, so Netflix pays the bill, so you don't need to worry about it. And it's like an exper experimental environment where you can uh, run this flow on, on AWS and just to feel the power of uh, turning your laptop into a supercomputer. And then uh, the way to do that is very easy. Uh, you just need to, uh, you just need to do this, Metaflow, uh, it's, the font is must be too small for you. Let me make it bigger. So configure sandbox. Uh, so I already have an um, existing profile. Uh, I already have an existing sandbox configuration. Let me just overwrite. So now we need a, a, a magic string. So we have the magic, magic string ready for you. So Sabine, can you help us post the magic string on, um, on Gitter and then, uh, and also maybe in chat, I can paste it here uh, and reconfig reconfigure it again. Okay, great. Uh, so I, I see, uh, thank you Sabine. So I see the, I see the screen now. I, I see the, I see the string ma magic string now. Just need to copy paste here. And then, yeah, so we configured successfully. Now, uh, just to make sure that we're running on cloud uh, in, Met, in our studio, let's do this uh, Metaflow get metadata. You see, so the metadata provider, which is the global data store that I was referring to, uh, is this, uh, uh, is already on AWS. You see, this is on AWS uh, US East. Um, Great. Okay, so uh, we're running on cloud. So I want to mention that uh, it's super easy to turn a linear flow working locally or just any Metaflow flow. If a flow works locally, it's super easy to turn your flow into, uh, into a flow that runs, um, runs on cloud or partially on cloud. For example, if the build model step is really 
computationally expensive, then you may want to run this on cloud. And what you need to do is just uh, simply put this uh, decorator here. Let me just do this here uh, together with you. I mean, the workspace, I want to go to uh, run.r. And I just need to, I'll do a batch decorator. I'll do a four CPU, a memory, a, a GB. So that's it. Um, let's let's run this. Source. Yep. So this is running. Um, yeah. So this. So the first uh, first the three steps will be the same as previous steps, which uh, uh, same as previous demo, which which runs locally. And then um, the interesting thing, the interesting thing is that the fourth step is gonna run on cloud, and you don't need to worry about copying data to the cloud. So, uh, so we can uh, uh, the, because the first three steps are, are already writing the Metaflow artifacts to the global data store uh, on AWS S3. So when you're running this uh, the fourth step on cloud, uh, we are when we are reading Metaflow artifacts, we automatically figure out where we should read the data. And then the data is also in sync with the current code. So you don't need to worry about the data management and everything is in sync. And then, um, and you don't need to worry about the, um, um, the specific AWS API that you need to use to, to uh, read data from different places. And then uh, if you do this yourself, then you have to configure the permissions for the, uh, for the AWS bucket, uh, which is really painful. Um, so we take care of all that uh, infrastructure DevOps work, and then uh, you see. So this is things are getting interesting. The build model stage are running on cloud. Uh, you see the status is submitted, and then uh, it becomes runnable, and it's starting. So uh, runnable means it's waiting in the queue. So we're not uh, uh, requesting a big box; it's just a small box, and then uh, it turned from. Um, runnable into starting in five seconds, so it's kind of okay. Um, so I want to mention that if you're if you're requesting a big box, um, sometimes AWS uh, it's gonna take a few minutes to ten minutes for AWS to allocate the big box to you. So this would make sense if your uh, if your script gonna actually run in, for example, three hours. If if you're running uh, locally, it's gonna take a few days. If you run on a big box on AWS, it's gonna take three hours. Uh, in that sense, it makes sense to wait here for the instance to get started. Um, um, if, you're, if your script uh, actually uh, only finish in 10 minutes or five minutes, maybe it's not really worth the wait. And then you can just uh, figure out a better way to do this. Maybe get a big instance on AWS and just turn that into your workstation. So you don't need to go through this trouble of submitting, waiting. Um, yeah, so this is like a trade-off. Um, so we're waiting here, but the benefit is that we are not uh, locking to any instance. So we can easily uh, tune up and down what kind of instances we need. This is great for, uh, this is great for prototyping because in prototyping, we don't exactly know how big the instance uh, actually gonna be because we're, for example, adding in more features, we're trying more complicated models. So uh, as we, as our project get more complicated, we want to upgrade to bigger and bigger instances. So uh, if, you, uh, if you decide on the big box, then uh, you won't be able to upgrade easily to another bigger box. And then um, when you're upgrading, you need to copy all the project uh, structure and everything to, a bit, to the bigger instance. Uh, which is not, not a pleasant experience. And, and, and very importantly, it's gonna uh, cost, a, cost you a lot of money if you just have a big box running all the time. So, uh, so the, our approach of doing things is so-called serverless computing. So you don't have this big box uh, running there all the time. You only use it when you, uh, when you need it. And, and then those instances got terminated automatically um, after your program finishes. So literally you don't have a, a server uh, running all the time. So that's why it's called serverless computing. Um, and you can see, um, so we waited a few, we waited for some time for the, uh, for the instance to start and then uh, 
the model trained successfully on the cloud. And then, uh, so we're printing some of the attributes of the model back locally. So, um, which is really nice. You can, um, I'll come back to this later, which means that you can expect uh, results locally on your, uh, on the R notebook in R Studio for the data are created on the cloud, which is really powerful feature. Okay, let me come back to the slides. Um, yeah, so seeing my demo, it actually took longer to start. Uh, yeah, it's just, uh, I, I was having, I was unlucky and that there's a, a very long queue um, and, and we're experimenting on different stuff. But uh, in our experiment, it's actually pretty quick. Um, yeah, so so great. So we are running part of uh, part of our flow on the cloud, and then with very minimal friction. Uh, there's no need to change our R functions. You can see that uh, we didn't change anything on the R function. The only thing that we change is to edit this uh, that creator here, and then um, and you can change it to anything else. And very importantly, this uh, infrastructure requirement is uh, version control together with uh, everything else. So this is called infrastructure as code. Uh, uh, it's, it's a very nice, uh, easy way for you, for your colleagues to reproduce, not on the uh, business logic level, but also on the infrastructure level. Because, uh, because uh, by doing this, you don't have to write in the instruction uh, readme saying that uh, you need to require this kind of instances to run, to reproduce this, uh, to reproduce this um, uh, project. Um, yeah. Okay, so I want to pause here and see if we have questions. Um, please post questions on either. Okay. Okay, so I saw there's a question on um, um, Metaflow install. Oh, I think this one, uh, you just need to do Metaflow install user equals false. And then, uh, and if you want to, if you want, if you run into any other trouble with the installation, check out our docs, uh, docs the metaflow dog of uh, variance r that uh, slash v slash r, and click install installing metaflow. And on the bottom part, there's a troubleshooting section. You can check out uh, for each kind of errors. Uh, I see for for this screenshot that um, that we we have on the guitar, this is this error. Cannot perform a dash dash user install. Just do this, and it should be fine. Uh, if not, please let us know. Um, yep. So let me just go back to the presentation. Uh, okay. So I think I'm in back in presentation mode. Oh yes, so Vili had a great point. So the sandbox is shared among everyone. So don't use any sensitive data. Um, pick your own username, uh, of course. Um, so your your stuff, your uh, all of your experimental um, experimental work stays in your own namespace. So pick a namespace that only uh, it's kind of unique. And then um, yeah, so um, that's it. So we are let's move on to the next feature for episode one. So I want to demo this very powerful feature called resume. Uh, this is the very similar idea with Drake. Drake also has this. Um, and then um, the idea is that because we are uh, capturing everything in the, um, we're capturing the code and data in the step and the steps are created for each run. Uh, so because of this, we're able to reproduce, we were able to rerun the flow from, uh, from any intermediate step, not from scratch. So if you want to resume the flow only from build model, for example, if, you, if there's an exception happening in build model, then you can resume from build model and not recomputing from start. And we will automatically reuse the results pre-computed from these two steps and use it directly start um, build model step. And uh, another situation you want to resume is that you're making some changes. So it's not any exception, but you just made a, um, made a change to build model and you want to uh, and you want to rerun this whole flow, and then um, and it's in at that at that time point because you know that you didn't make any changes in the previous two steps. It doesn't make sense to run the whole the whole thing from start 
and you can just uh, resume from this uh, the search step. So we have the uh, we have a, a feature called resume for this, and then um, in in Metaflow you can think about uh, steps as a managed checkpoints. So we uh, so this is a managed checkpoints because it's easier than um, than um, than having check doing checkpoints yourself. If you're uh, if we're doing manual checkpoints, then you have to uh, take care of the uh, file names. You have to, for example, create a different folder for different experiments. And then in the experiments, you need to create folder for each step, uh, for each R function. And then you have to make sure the file name don't overwrite each other. So uh, so managing a checkpoint is uh, not it's not that e easy to do it right. So uh, using Metaflow, you have uh, you have a managed checkpoints automatically because for each step we are persisting the code and data um, um, in the step. Let's just try this. So uh, it's very easy to do resume. There's two ways you can resume. Uh, you can just do resume equals true. In this case, we'll figure out the, um, um, we'll, we will try to figure out the, uh, the last step where you had an exception and resume from the exception, the error step. And then if you just want to resume from a build model step, like in this case, I didn't have any error, but I just I made some changes. I just want to restart, rerun from this step. I just need to do this. Um, if you remember, we had this run, um, we had we had this run at the end of the um, DAG declaration. Here, you see there's a run. You just need to add a run um, uh, inside run. You had to add this argument resume equals true, and this should work. Let me get back to uh, our, my R Studio. Uh, let me get back to the R Studio. So make sure, so I'm in my workspace. Okay, so this is wrong. I'll just do resume. Let's resume from the build model. Just to make it run quicker, I'm gonna delete this for now because it's, because uh, uh, it's, it's uh, we don't need to wait for um, instances to start running locally just to make things uh, faster and just to demo resume. Uh, let's just source this file and uh, some interesting things are going to happen. Let's take a look together. You see, so this is kind of different. It's saying gathering required information to resume ROM. So in the back end, we're, we're comparing the, the current flow with the previous flow. We're figuring out uh, uh, which part we need to copy from the previous ROM and which part we need to, uh, which step we actually need to resume from. And then um, same as a cloning result of a previous run. So it's not doing any recomputation of the start step. It's cloning results of pool data as well. It's not doing computation on that uh, step. Cloning result on the third step, compute features. And then we're gonna start uh, the, actually start building this model. Um, so yeah, so this is how resume works. Um, let's just wait a, wait a moment. It's gonna uh, take some time for us to build a model because it's a GBM model with hundreds of trees. It's, it's gonna take some time. Um, yeah, so it's gonna look like this uh, where you will see that uh, task finished and it will be able to print results as well. You see the step after the resume step is still gonna, still gonna run. And we figure out which steps are um, are subsequent uh, of the resume step. Um, um, if if those steps depend on uh, if those steps depend depends on the resume step, then we will not clone the result, but uh, we will refresh it. We'll rerun it because uh, we're assuming that something happening with this step, and then um, yeah, it will look like this. Let me just check back. Yes. So same as the screenshots, we're running this computation again, and it's done. Um, yeah, so, so yeah, so that's, that's resume. And then uh, if you have an exception in build model, you can do this as well. And you can just, uh, for example, uh, like a very typical workflow for, my, for me personally when I'm iterating locally is that um, I will just debug this flow. If something goes wrong, uh, I will fix that step. And then uh, after I fix that step, I will resume from that step. So this is really a powerful feature for uh, local iteration, and um, Drake does this as well very nicely. So I'm going to pause here to see if we have question. Let me take a look at the Peter. 
Okay, so there's uh, nothing new. Let me go on to uh, the final part of episode one. Um, yeah, so so this is the uh, the notebook uh, the the um, the result uh, the the result sharing part that I talked previously. So uh, in in Metaflow, uh, you can actually inspect previous runs in the notebook. Uh, you can set namespace. You can uh, you can do all kinds of stuff um, to check previous runs and previous steps. I'll I'll demo this later with the notebook. And then I want to just reiterate on the points I mentioned below. Uh, I mentioned before. Uh, so Metaflow maintains a global data store of all past runs for all teammates. Um, the teammates have their own namespace and they're isolated uh, between each other. Uh, but uh, yeah, so but everyone can switch their namespace like I did here. You can set your namespace to your colleague's namespace, and you can query their runs. And then, um, and it's gonna be safe. You won't overwrite their results in uh, any way, and then they can continue to uh, run experiments and then run their flow in production. So, and you can inspect the production results without worrying about uh, um, tampering with uh, production runs. So, um, and, uh, and your colleagues can actually do this from any machine, not just from their laptop, they can run this from uh, the cloud workstation, and then the, the same notebook runs everywhere. Because as long as you're connected to Metaflow Global Data Store, uh, this thing um, runs everywhere. So you, uh, it, this is very different from, uh, from, um, from uh, like, uh, the experience without Metaflow. Um, if you don't have Metaflow, then what people usually do is that they're reading data from a local directory. And then um, in that case, um, this kind of thing won't work necessarily if you run it in a different place. Um, yes, so let me just demo this um, with episode one. I'm switching back to our studio. So I have the, I have this review. This is our markdown file. Just click, click review. Oh, uh, I need to, let me just run this. Um, so first of all, you need to uh, import library, uh, Metaflow. And then uh, we, have, uh, um, we have a flow client, step client, and run client. Cause uh, um, so we have different hier uh, object, uh, we, have the, uh, we have object hi hierarchy. Uh, so the higher level object is the flow. Inside flow, we have runs. For every run, you will create a run object. Uh, like every time you source run.r, we will create a run object. Inside run object, we have step object. So inside, st uh, inside step object, we'll have task object. So um, um, in, um, in most cases, each step will just have uh, one task. But if your step uh, is a failed step, we'll talk about it later. Sometimes your step may run, um, may run the same code with different parameters like uh, I talked before. Uh, in that case, your step may have multiple tasks. Each task is going to run the same uh, run the same code with different parameter. And then, um, yeah. So the top level is the flow client. And then let's just run this. And um, um, before executing the second block, let's just check all the previous runs. So I can just do this, and then I can print all the previous runs. You see, these are the run IDs of previous runs. Um, and let me just do, let me just check run, the most recent run, 31. Um, this is my own namespace. And then um, I'm running this, uh, I'm creating a run client. And then uh, this is the, this is how you specify a run. This is a flow name slash uh, the run ID. And then uh, we can print um, the artifacts of the run. And uh, we will uh, query one of the artifacts and uh, we will um, check out the features, we'll inspect the features, and we'll also query the models and we'll check out the models. Let's just run this. Yeah, you see. Right, so um, nice. So let's uh, check this out in preview mode. Um, so namespace, uh, these are the artifacts that we have for the run. 
uh, so we have features, we have models, we have uh, the DT is the, the raw data set that we created. Uh, probably need a better name. <laughs> yeah, so we can query this feature set. Uh, so we're querying the feature set in an immutable manner. So we don't need to worry about tampering with this feature set that our colleague generated. And by doing this, we can also stay up to date with my with our colleagues results. We just need to check this and see uh, what's the most recent run. And then uh, and print out, uh, check out this, uh, check out the data table, and then we can check out this model that we created before, and print this model. See, this is a gradient boosting model. How many samples, predictors? Uh, yeah, so um, we can do some um, prediction. We can uh, like cross check with the of the model um, um, some holdout data, and in this notebook as well. And I just want to highlight a few more. Uh, features of uh, of our um, uh, of our Metaflow client. So uh, for each round, you can actually uh, check out some of the uh, um, timestamps. For example, you can check uh, when is it, when is it created uh, and when is it finished. Uh, finished at uh, so it's so you see. So we have snap. We have uh, time shots. Uh, we have timestamp of all the rounds. And you you have timestamp of all the steps as well, and then um, yeah, and then you can check if this is run successfully. Um, yeah, so this is successful, and then what I can do is uh, we we actually have a we have a building function, um, we have a building function to print the summary of the run. Um, no, summary. So this is a summary of the run. See, it's successful. Uh, it took 1.4 minutes. And you can do this. You can call summary on uh, run object, step object, or uh, the other objects. Um, yeah, so this is Metaflow client. Uh, you can check out more on our docs. Um, um, yeah, so we have a section on the on Metaflow client. Um, just pause here. Uh, for questions, and this is also the end of episode one. So my uh, colleague uh, Brian will take over and talk about episode two and three. Um, okay, there's uh, no questions. Now I'm giving over the stage to Brian. Let me just stop sharing. Uh, Oh, sure. Okay, Brian, feel free to share your screen right now. <clears throat> uh, Brian, can you talk? There we go. Me, there we go. Um, all right, that was amazing. Um, so uh, let me share my screen. And everyone can see this, it's all right. Great. Um, here we go. Oops. And we're good. All right. Um, for uh, a bit of history, um, I was the uh, first person to take a stab at <clears throat> uh, these R bindings for Metaflow. Uh, and a few years ago, um, spoke at Uzar about it, um, and then Sabine did uh, last year. And I'm um, really excited to uh, kind of share with this with the community. Um, I've had like a lot of schemes uh, for Metaflow and like um, I'm excited that uh, other people can, you know, fix a lot of my uh, API decisions. 
Okay, so um, we're now uh, going to uh, introduce uh, a few new concepts. Um, one is uh, branching, and the other is uh, introducing parameters. So um, branching, uh, as Jason alluded to earlier, was uh, a parallel process um, that uh, kind of branches out. And then there's uh, a joint step that uh, pulls everything together. And um, parameters allow you to, at the command line, um, adjust uh, different variables and is kind of the um, magic behind a lot of the for each uh, horizontal scaling um, features that um, are going to be so powerful. So um, great. So um, and when we're kind of like looking at our um, maximize this um, flow, um, there's really not much. Uh, that we would have to change here. Um, as you can see, uh, we're just introducing um, another uh, new model. Um, and the uh, only difference towards the end is that we need to uh, specify that uh, there's a joint step uh, going on. Um, and uh, these branches don't necessarily have to so um, kind of uh, be uh, one level deep, um, they can, uh, you know, continually kind of go down. And um, this example today is using Carrot, but um, the Tidy Models framework uh, really lends itself well to this, um, as at the end of the day, these, uh, the re resamples in uh, those set of packages is really just um, kind of lists and nested lists. So um, with uh, using kind of like tidy models, it uh, really would just be to uh, specify the inner loop of uh, a uh, the core kind of like modeling here. Um, and then it would be, uh, relatively easy to like uh, nest those on top of one another. So, um, and now that um, the R community has embraced uh, the functional um, workflow of the, the per uh, package, um, it, it shouldn't be uh, too difficult to take a single model and uh, really uh, flex some some metaflow on it. <clears throat> so uh, to reiterate, um, we're just uh, introducing a new function for this lasso model, um, and then at the end uh, we just have a, a join flag. Um, cool. And um, you know, Metaflow has been uh, kind of touted as, you know, machine learning uh, tool for, you know, really uh, intense kind of uh, CPU intensive modeling. Uh, but when I was initially working on this, um, I felt that it was going to be very powerful for, uh, you know, like a uh, workflow scheduler, uh, kind of like airflow, where um, at the end of the day, you're really just writing uh, R code. And I, I've always felt that like um, airflow is pretty opinionated as to how you set things up. So um, the, the core construct of Metaflow is that you're just writing in your, your native language and uh, all of these best practices are kind of handled automatically behind the scenes uh, without having uh, too much overhead of, you know, um, kind of moving your functions into a certain paradigm. So, um, yeah. So again, we're, we're just gonna uh, 
adding a new function and kind of joining at the end. Um, cool. And uh, going to try to do this live. All right. Hopefully my um, our studio isn't too obnoxious for everybody. Um, all right, so go to files. All right, we're in our branches. So um, here's the completed uh, run step, and um, you know these are the, are the new features here. Um, so um, if these did not have uh, defaults, um, they would uh, error out if you were uh, running these as you were before. Um, but the kind of magical bits of, uh, let me do this as a job. Cool. Um, so uh, these changed, um, and then uh, we have this new lasso model here. Um, and so uh, to do this parallel fan out or um, parameter, uh, this branching of uh, these different models, um, you know, it was uh, extremely kind of lightweight in that you just had to add another step of a DAG. So um, here it is taking um, our two parameters um, and uh, kind of has the same uh, signature as uh, the other model, but that's uh, not kind of required. Um, so, yeah, um, and um, these parameters can be uh, anything kind of at all. And if you were kind of going to run this on the command line, uh, actually not sourced in, um, but you would run it as, And then um, anything that is a parameter um, immediately comes available uh, to be surfaced as a, uh, a flag. So, uh, cool. And it's not going to probably like this because I don't think I have the Python activated. Oh, it did. Cool. Um, so, uh, oop. let me show you again. Um, so yeah, um, nothing uh, really too tricky here. Um, again, we're just uh, adding uh, another R function to the flow and uh, adding this join step at the end. And, um, all right. So, and um, another thing I wanted to uh, kind of highlight um, about uh, the client API is that uh, these flows are uh, really just uh, nested lists. So um, it can be uh, really easy uh, to pull out what you need um, using per, for example. Um, and I like really um, agreed with the philosophy of Metaflow where um, you expose the, the tools and um, the developer can really uh, take uh, take it in a direction um, and kind of extend it 
how they want. So um, when I was working on this in Netflix, I really, I really thought that uh, there would be a lot of uh, kind of Metaflow powered shiny apps, for example, um, since uh, your ETL for a shiny app can basically be done once and then thrown into a flow um, and uh, kind of schedule. So, um, so yeah. Uh, anything on parameters or um, branching? So uh, Jason did a really great job of introducing it um, at the beginning. Um, so let me. All right, um, and similarly with uh, the the for each fan out, um, it uh, doesn't take uh, any modification to your actual R code. Um, you're just uh, specifying a few different flags uh, to implement uh, this. Um, to really take what you had a uh, prototype under your laptop um, and you know put it on a bunch of machines in the cloud if um, kind of have that that set up Ooh, I think I'm running from an old one but um, let me jump into the for each guy. Um, so this uh, didn't have uh, anything uh, change outside of this line. Uh, and uh, I believe that you know this joint step remained the same as well. So um, you know uh, metaphor really exposes you know the, the basic constructs um, where you can really uh, express uh, fairly complicated things uh, really easily, um, just kind of like writing our code. So, um, and in this one, you know, the the actual model um, didn't change at all. So, um, let me run this guy. Just the three. Yeah. So I, I really think that um, there'll be a lot of interesting future directions that kind of people take with this. Um, for I, for example, um, I think that there's a lot um, that could be done with uh, shiny and kind of the R Studio API, um, <clears throat> and um, for example, uh, kind of using the API to uh, surface um, a lot of the, the client exploration as um, a background job in the viewer pane. Um, and I don't know. I have a, I have a lot of uh, out there ideas that I'm really uh, glad that. Uh, Netflix finally uh, open sourced this and puts um, you know talented people like Jason and Sabine on this to um, take take the R package to the next level. Um, so this one uh, again, you know, we uh, didn't have to change any code. We just changed um, our flags here. So. Um, Um, <clears throat> so these parameters uh, here are, are hard coded, but um, if we combine this you know, with the um, parameter from the earlier uh, or the 
primer from the, the earlier lesson, um, you know, this could be uh, specified at, at runtime, um, which makes it a, a great tool for uh, kind of a, uh, more data engineering and uh, type of workloads. All right, um, so those are two uh, really uh, powerful features that uh, um, really align with functional programming. And um, so um, I think that you can do um, a lot with small composable chunks of our code and, and let Metaflow uh, kind of take take it from there. Um, and I think the uh, opportunity for uh, reproducibility in uh, data science work is um, it's really going to be um, kind of a great tool for that. Um, and I kind of felt that it was kind of ch cheating almost for, for this kind of uh, work from well, the tooling that was, you know, back in 2017. Um, so, all right, we've got a question. Uh, this. All right, I'm gonna stop. And I think um, Jason's gonna go deep on um, the AWS integration. Hey, thank you for, for, for the nice introduction of branches and for each uh, those are really nice features that I, that I super that I really, that I really really love about my metaflow because it uh, it allows me to easily scale uh, scale out uh, uh, even locally I so for me it's kind of not easy to write parallel uh, programs in R um, but with for each and branches I could always easily do that uh, even if I'm just on local so on the next episode, episode four, I'm gonna talk about how to do for each branches on AWS. Uh, let me just share my screen right now. Um, yeah, um, Jason, we had a question on the Q and A. If, if we have uh, time for that, um, let me take a look. He's asking. Um, yeah. So. Uh, so I'm just looking at the chats. Oh, uh, Q and A. Um, yeah. Um, so, oh, okay. This is all. There are already a lot of questions on Q and A. So I was, uh, I missed this when I was presenting. Um, I think the most recent question is, uh, what happens when next step is a vector like uh, next step equals. Uh, is the input for each uh, for each uh, vector of the screen? Uh, yes. So so basically, what you do is uh, let me share my screen right now, and I can show you um, how this is done. And um, okay, I I have uh, Q and A floating in my another screen, so I can see Q and A as well now. Um, so to answer the question, I think this is a great question. Um, and uh, let's just go back to the code for branches. Uh, let's go in the scripts. And then the, so we're, we're doing branches in build models. Okay, we're building two models and then in summarizing models, uh, in select model, select model is the join step. So what, you, so what we do is uh, we can do, uh, in join model step, uh, we have this extra argument called inputs. So you can do inputs dollar sign step name. Then that will give you the object for the previous step. Um, and then you can call uh, model because we have model here for this step. And then um, you, can, you, can, you can call um, dollar sign model to get the model created in that step. And you can create, you can call this inputs dollar sign build lasso model, dollar sign model, and you can get the model built in the um, uh, lasso step. So this is how uh, we can refer to each of the step, uh, each of the branch, branching steps uh, in the join step. So this thing is called the join step. And then we we'll call it the join step because, uh, because they, we have to uh, specify this to be a join um, here. 
to be a join here. So we do join equals true. We say the select model is a join step. Um, and then we have to make two arguments, um, self and the input. And then we can do inputs dollar sign to refer to any of the previous step in the branches. In the branches. Um, yes. So I, uh, when I was looking at the cats, I also saw some um, questions on installation. So I just want to mention that uh, I know a lot of our users are using our Windows. So we, uh, so Metaflow package was initially developed on Mac OS and Linux, but uh, we tested out that, uh, um, that uh, and we confirmed that they can indeed run on Windows, but only with uh, WSL2 support. WSL is this new Windows 10 features that's, um, uh, that's basically a building, uh, building Linux kernel for Windows, and you can install WSL2, and uh, with WSL2, you can install um, Ubuntu, an app from a Windows App Store. And uh, inside Ubuntu, then everything is the same as in Windows or uh, Mac OS. So we have, uh, we have a guide here in our uh, installation, um, installation um, document, uh, Windows support. Uh, check out this if you're using Windows. Um, yes, uh, let me go to the next episode. Uh, this is gonna be the final episode, also the most exciting one. Uh, yeah, so, so here we're gonna uh, we're gonna do this fan out on AWS batch because this is kind of uh, uh, a very very frequent use case. Uh, we often have in in statistics we either want to um, do like bootstrapping. Uh, we want to do a lot of bootstrapping, and then for each bootstrap data we build a model, or we want to tune parameters uh, parameters for the model, parameters for the feature. So each of this parameter or each, each of the bootstrap step actually is gonna be a big computation step um, because it's, uh, it's, it's almost like a, a full model building process just with different parameter or with different sample data. And then, um, so I myself uh, find, uh, find it to be extremely useful to do at least, for example, bootstrapping uh, with Metaflow uh, for each branches. And then I, uh, when I don't have enough resources locally, Sometimes I can do like uh, four branches for my for each branch locally, but my laptop is not big enough. I if I want to do hundreds of branches, I have to scale it out to AWS. And then uh, here's uh, this is how we do it. Uh, the point I want to make is that it's uh, it's the same, super simple to do that. Uh, uh, assume that uh, we already have. Uh, let me let me get into presentation mode. Uh, okay. So assume that we already have the, this for each, uh, uh, the for each flow running nicely at locally, then uh, we only need to add this decorator to this for each step uh, so that uh, we can run each of the step on, um, on AWS remotely. Let me just do this. Um, AWS episode hub. Um, so, yeah, so the script is uh, exactly the same as episode three, the 4-H branch. The only difference is this. Uh, if you're editing locally, you can you just need to um, um, add this decorator to your 4-H step. And then let's source this. We're gonna run, or this should be able to run on the cloud. Uh, episode four, can episode four, and then we can source it. Yeah, so I want to mention that um, only this step, this step is running on cloud. The previous steps are not running on cloud. And then, um, right, so, um, and, and this, is, this is something uh, that we like to do um, because, for example, um, in the feature computation sta stage or in the, uh, um, the previous data cleaning stage, we want to do um, a lot of data cleaning on the explorative analysis locally. And then, um, and it's probably not requiring that many resources. It doesn't doesn't need to be bootstrapped. It doesn't need to be tuned on parameters. So we just run it locally. Um, so, uh, sometimes we would prefer to run this locally because of the overhead of running on the cloud. As you can see, sometimes we need to. Uh, as you can see in the previous demo, um, sometimes we need to wait for like two minutes or so, uh, five minutes to uh, wait for the cloud instances to start. And uh, there's a small overhead there. Um, let's just wait a little bit. This is in start step. While we're waiting, I can uh, come back to this. Okay, so 
Yeah, so the idea is that uh, in the previous step, you have this compute features, um, and we assign different parameters to the, to the parameter that we want to search over with. And uh, let me just check, uh, let's just check in the script. Um, oh, my R Studio is getting stuck. It's fine. Uh, so, hmm. okay. Let's just wait for a moment. I think it's just this, this guy is running and then our, our studio is getting stuck. Um, yeah, so in the for each branches, um, in the compute feature branches, we are uh, specifying the, the name of the, uh, the, the name of the parameter that we want to search over with. And uh, this is the for each branch. This is a step uh, previous to the uh, for each uh, step. And then um, um, when you're running in for each step, we're actually, uh, we'll actually be able to, to run this step with multiple tasks. Uh, again, I want to reemphasize the object hierarchy. So we have a, a flow object, which is uh, the name of the flow. And this is the, 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 the top level object. Inside flow object, we have run object. And then um, each run, every, every time you source run the R, you create a run object, so you have a run ID. And then, um, and for inside run object, we have step object. And then uh, you see for this guy, this guy, they're all, they're all step object. This is also a step object. So this is different because inside this step object, there are task objects as well. So uh, we will create five task objects inside, uh, inside this step, each task taking a different parameter. So inside the build GBM model, you can do self dollar sign input to, to get to fetch the parameter that, uh, that get assigned to this uh, function. Um, and, um, and then in the, flow, uh, in the actual flow structure, uh, we specify um, LR is the parameter that we want to assign to the for each step. Um, as you can see here, um, so this is not for each script. So I want to pull, pull up for each script, but uh, looks like my R studio is somehow getting stuck. Um, yeah, searching for definition, it's just getting stuck. Let me just wait, wait a moment. If it doesn't come back out, I'll just, uh, I'll just go to the, um, I'll check out the, uh, so it's all of the code are, um, oh, it's finished. Is it finished? Yes, it's, uh, it's actually finished. So it was stuck for a moment. Uh, let's take a look. Wow, there's a lot of information. Let me just, uh, uh, yeah, I know this is going to be harder for you to read, but I just want to, uh, if you look at the structure, you see for each yield five steps. When you source this, you can see we created five steps. And uh, you can see task is starting, five different tasks. Um, same step name, but different PID process ID. And each task is running with a different uh, cloud instance. This is the uh, UID for the cloud instance. So, the, so they get from submitted to runnable to starting um, each of them. So um, at this time, we're gonna have five instances starting on the cloud at the same time. And then after it's starting, it's, it's gonna start crunching numbers for us. And then, uh, yeah, so these are all the information on setting up task environment, task is starting because we have five tasks running. So this output is kind of verbose. Um, you see the task, uh, everything finished successfully, and we have the select model. What the select model is doing is that it's checking all of the models. Uh, build models, select models is uh, we can do uh, a full loop of the inputs, um, and and you can do uh, for each of the item. So each item in the input represent a, a branch. Uh, it, 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 it represent a branch uh, in our uh, in our step in here. And then, um, and we can call uh, dollar sign model to get the model actually built in that branch in that within that task on the cloud. And uh, we check R square if it's uh, if it's bigger than the best, then we uh, update the best model. And by doing this, we select the best model according to the R square. And then uh, the final step is summarizing. 
So uh, yeah, so this is how I like to do parameter search or bootstrapping on the cloud uh, very easily with Metaflow. Um, yeah, so so I, I wanted to mention that um, uh, that the basic syntax for us to specify the for each parameter is by doing this. I think Brian may also have mentioned this previously, but just want to reemphasize a little bit. And then you specify this, and then this could be like a super long list, 100, uh, 100 parameters maybe, and you do you specify for each parameter inside this step for for, for compute features. You say I want to search over for each, and then the next step is gonna do this for each uh, for each computing, and this uh, this is after this for each branch, uh, and then we we'll do uh, we we'll have a join branch. Same with um, like branching, uh, we have a join, and then we select the best model. And then, yeah, that's it. So this is a, a very, our very powerful cloud experience. And, and let me come back to the slides. Right. Yeah, Jason, I just want to add one thing. Uh, can you go back to the <clears throat> uh, join step code? Um, join step? Uh, uh, in, when there's one, yeah, cool. So um, what um, would be um, really neat to do in the um, kind of like the per way would be to uh, kind of like make these into uh, list columns. So you can imagine your return object um, is this kind of like nice tibble with um, all the nested objects in it. And so um, I think uh, Metaflow combined with um, a lot of the the per tools, um, you know, has a, the chance to be like really, really uh, great for um, productivity. So yes, so the inputs itself is uh, is actually a uh, it's it's a list. You can just do this and then uh, model and then without uh, R square. So it's a it's a list, and we also have a function called uh, gather uh, gather uh, inputs. And then we can, for example, there's a, our Metaflow function called gather input. So we can just uh, use that to gather all the uh, results variable from all of the branches. And then um, that's also something that's uh, available. And then we can check it out. Uh, for example, uh, gather inputs. Um, uh, help, it's not really, oh, I should do this, Metaflow. Metaflow gather inputs. Yeah, so you can see, so this is a uh, this input inputs here and then uh, input inputs alpha or in this case, it gonna, we can do input model and then we'll be able to create a, create a list of, we're, we're, we're gonna create a, like a vector and then um, of the alpha um, objects, data object, data Metaflow artifacts for each of the branches. And then you can do um, subsequent data wrangling for the models created in each of the branches. So yeah, just as Brian has pointed out, um, uh, we are, the inputs is already in somehow uh, like a flat, uh, it's kind of a, just a list and then you can use um, the, all the other tidyverse packages to play with it. Um, yep, so close this one out and um, just go back here. Uh, let me take a look at the Gitter. Uh, again, I don't see Q&A anymore. Oh, I, I see Q&A now. Uh, there is no new questions. There's no new questions, so I'm just moving on. Uh, more about Metaflow. So uh, yeah, so as Evan has uh, talked about in the beginning, so the, the goal of this uh, talk is to simply get you excited about the um, Metaflow. It's a like a gentle introduction of the key features. We have some other nice features. For example, you can execute the flow in a fault tolerant uh, fault tolerant fashion, and you can use tags as namespaces. For example, you can tag your runs um, with different names. Like for example, you have an idea for a feature engineering, then you can tag your run with a like say clever feature engineering idea. Then um, and then you can query all the runs that belongs to a certain tag, and then uh, the tags will behave will behave somehow similar to a namespace, and then you can check out our docs, uh, check out check out our docs here, and then um, 
if you go back, so this is this section is about the details of MetaFlow, the our language features, the basics, and uh, let me just make it a little bit bigger. Uh, the dealing with failures, we have different different ways to deal with failures. Uh, like we have retry, and then uh, we have uh, we have catch to catch this like um, um, platform exceptions. We cannot really rely on the try catch inside R because imagine you're running on AWS and your staff runs on AWS. If uh, if something happens to your AWS instance, uh, let's say the instance got uh, interrupted or AWS had a had an error, then uh, your code I would actually not be able to have a chance to run this try catch because there's nothing wrong with your code. It's just your hardware uh, um, run into a problem. So uh, we have a higher level of uh, um, on failures. Uh, um, we have a higher ha um, we have a higher level uh, mechanism for dealing with failures, which is a, a, a try catch mechanism on the infrastructure level. And this way, we can uh, maximize. We will be able to maximize the uh, the safety uh, of running things on the cloud. And then, um, in the organizing results section, you can see that uh, um, the users will have the namespace for their runs. Uh, they, they call it. They, are the, they have the same name. Uh, predict prediction flow, uh, but um, but they they belong they belong to different uh, teammates, and uh, that's totally fine. And and then you can just um, um, you can switch namespace like this as I talked previously, and then um, and you can you can run stuff with a tag, crazy test, and then um, you can just uh, cre query all the runs that's uh, uh, that's labeled with this tag. This is a way for you to organize your runs. Um, yeah, so so I want to yeah that's that's it for our tutorial. Just to recap our uh, philosophy of Metaflow. So we want to, um, yeah, so basically by doing this tight integration with AWS, we want to provide this first grade support for data warehouse, compute resource orchestration, job scheduling, project architecture, versioning of model operations. And then we want to move, uh, we want to let uh, data scientists move very fast on the top two layers, uh, model development and feature engineering, which is, uh, which is where they can maximize their uh, value add. Um, yeah, so uh, we're open source on GitHub. Uh, you can learn more about us on our doc. You can chat out, uh, chat with the team. Uh, so this is our GitHub channel. Uh, we are almost there, uh, twenty four seven. Uh, almost twenty four seven. I would say. Uh, we'll try to answer questions as soon as possible. And then, um, yeah. So with this, I'm handing the stage back to Celine. Let me stop uh, the share. All right. Uh Thanks, Jason and Brian. Uh, so we are right on time, uh, but if you guys have any questions, we are happy to take those live. Uh, please use the hand mechanism uh, in Zoom, and then we'll unmute you uh, if you have any questions for us. And uh, as uh, Jason and Brian mentioned before, uh, all the documentation is available at metaflow.org uh, and it also has links to our Gitter chat channel. So at any point in time, if you feel that Metaflow is something that you can use uh, in your workflow, please do reach out to us. Uh, we'd be happy to engage with you. Uh, if you feel that there are features uh, that Metaflow doesn't address today, uh, uh, but can be helpful for you, please again reach out to us. Uh, we are formulating our roadmap in this space and your input, your feedback uh, is going to be really, really helpful for us. Let's see if we have uh, any questions. Um, so, so we do have uh, a bunch of questions in the Q and A. Um, so, one question is: uh, Is there a quick way to say, "Give me the artifact called model from the most recent successful run"? Yes, exactly. So, so we do have a Metaflow client, and uh, in that Metaflow client, you can very easily reference a specific flow, and then we have pointers to say the latest run or the latest successful run, and then you can very easily access all the artifacts uh, of that flow or a specific artifact. 
if you are interested um, more, uh, so there is documentation. So uh, there is a section in the documentation called uh, inspecting flows and results uh, that has all the necessary detail. Uh, next question is, is the global data store required to be on Amazon S3 or is it possible to replace this backend with something else? Uh, so currently the backends that we support are your local file system uh, or it can be Amazon S3. Uh, but then uh, Metaflow has a plugin architecture. So uh, you can in theory bring in your own uh, data store and uh, you can plug into uh, it with that. If you have a specific requirement, uh, please do reach out to us. We'd be happy to engage. Uh, there has been uh, some progress on uh, the GCP front as well. There have been numerous individuals, uh, organizations as well, uh, who want an equivalent support for GCP. Uh, so if, if that's something of interest, we do have open GitHub issues uh, where we would like you to weigh in. I have a question on that. Uh, so. Um, would it be possible to extend this to like Minio, Mini IO, uh, which kind of like adheres to the S3 API, but I think is your, kind of your own thing, right? <laughs> yes. Uh, so as a matter of fact, you can actually uh, do that for uh, Min.io, uh, which provides S3 compatible APIs. We do have a few individuals who are using Metaflow in that way, where rather than using Amazon S3, uh, they essentially authenticate to their uh, min.io cluster and they're able to do that. So uh, all you need to do is uh, in your uh, Metaflow configuration, rather than pointing to an AWS S3 bucket, uh, you just point to a min.io cluster. So and it will just work the same. All right. Um, I see that we don't have uh, any other questions. Uh, it was really great. Uh, for all of you to join us. Uh, I know that, you know, in certain parts of the world, the time uh, just didn't align well. Uh, but as Jason said, as Brian said before, uh, if at any point in time, uh, the team can be helpful to you uh, in any of your Metaflow needs, uh, please give us a shout. And uh, thank you. Uh, and thanks to the organizers at the user uh, community as well for setting this up. All right.